Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Bound by the Cloak. I'm Zoe. And I'm Chandi. And today our guest is Corey Nathan. Corey is the host of the podcast, Talking Politics and Religion Without Killing Each Other. Corey's story is really unique. His family is originally from Brooklyn, New York, but he was raised in an Orthodox Jewish family in New Jersey. In his 20s, he started grappling with his spiritual identity and eventually became a born-again Christian. Corey eventually came to realize that much of the social and political evangelical American culture, beliefs, and thoughts are not really aligned with biblical scripture. So you mean to say people who claim that they're Christian are not actually following Christian values? I don't want to say that they're not following Christian values, right? I would say kind of like many other religions, right? There's the actual scripture and what that says, and then there's the culture of the religion, right? I mean, you can find the same thing, right? You can be culturally Christian, but not actually follow the religion. Or you can be culturally Christian and follow the religion, right? Yeah, so let's hear more about his journey. Corey, thanks so much for being on the podcast today. Thanks for having me. It's so nice to see you guys. Tell us about yourself. Could you introduce yourself? Sure, sure. So I am a, I was raised, my family's all from Brooklyn, uh, but I grew up more on the Jersey side after we we moved from New York. And uh, I was raised in a very observant Jewish family. We went to an Orthodox synagogue. And then when I was a young man, I started out in the professional world. I was a stockbroker. And uh, if anybody's ever seen the movie Boiler Room, that was my life. That was crazy how accurate that movie was. Uh, I ended up parking my license with Merrill Lynch, my Series 7, Series 63 with Merrill Lynch after I got out of the game. And I just found out Merrill Lynch is just the same thing, but they just had better branding. (laughs) I might get I might get arrested now. No, this was like early 90s. But I was doing that during the day, but I was going to a theater conservatory at night. I was learning method acting, classical training, and you know, everything from the writing and the producing and the directing and learning great literature. It was a really great experience. And I continued that. What really continued was having one foot in the business world and one foot in the arts. And that that kept up throughout my adult life. Uh, Now, on the spiritual side, in my late 20s, I went about this very earnest inquiry because I had these big existential questions. Is there a God? And what is God doing in the world? And where is this all going? What's wrong in the universe? What can we do about what's wrong in the universe? I had big questions. And my inquiry led to something that was very inconvenient for me as a you know, as a Jew, as an observant Jew, which was this whole Jesus thing made way more sense than I ever thought it would. I just looked at it as um, what we Jews think of as a uh, Devar Torah, like explanation of Torah or the first five books. He was explaining some big concepts in there. I later found out that that was a Sermon on the Mount that I was reading. And it just was more prof- the most profound Devar Torah, if you will, that I'd ever read, heard, or, or seen. And it was, um, it, it was definitely life-changing because then uh, about, it was a, good six to eight months. But eventually I came to believe that Jesus was in fact the Messiah. I believe in some of the supernatural parts of it, like the, you know, the resurrection and all that. I'm not one of those guys who believes in like seven literal 24 hour days. I just don't think that's necessary. Uh, In fact, it's too much at odds with what else makes sense, you know, evolution and, you know, and all that. So that, that stuff is not at odds with my faith at all, but that thing, that, that decision to become a Christian and to accept Jesus as Messiah was a really big change in my life. And uh, that was, that was in my late twenties. I was about 29, I think when that happened. So the next, you know, 20 something years, I've always had to learn being a guy with one foot in business, one foot in the arts. Those are two very different worlds. Being a guy that grew up with um, going to an Orthodox synagogue uh, versus the last 20 years going to a lot of evangelical, I'm in a Presbyterian church now, but a lot of evangelical churches, um, those are two very different worlds. Um, and, and not just religious, but political worlds. 
So being able to have conversations, nurture relationships in worlds that are so far apart from each other, ecosystems, political, religious, uh, cultural ecosystems that are so far apart from each other, that's really been my life and my life's work. It's mostly been an avocation, but about uh, two, a little less than two years ago, I decided to make it part of my vocation, which is why we started talking politics and religion about killing each other. And you haven't killed anyone yet, right? Not that I know of. Not that I know of. Although I had a conversation with a couple callers this morning on, on another program, and uh, I might have given one or two of them a heart attack. They, uh, they, they apparently <laughs> objected to some of what I said. I can neither confirm nor deny those reports. <laughs> <laughs> well, objection, right? Yeah, People object yeah. to a lot of things these yeah. days. So Sure, sure. So let's go back a bit and just talk about you know the fact that you, you grew up Orthodox Jewish. And I guess at what point did you sort of, I don't want to even know, know if I want to say disbelieve, but at what point did you sort of come to the conclusion that this, this is not, this is not it for me. Like this is not the way I think and the way I feel and the way I believe. Yeah. So it's an, inter- it's an interesting way that you put that question because I don't see as much of a discontinuation of how I grew up as much of a continuation of how I grew up. I have one of my favorite historians and theologians, this guy named N.T. Wright, Tom Wright. And he did a lot of work on first century Israel, first century Palestine. And because of reading, especially his bigger books, his more academic books, I was able to imagine myself at that time. And the schism between Christianity and Judaism happened much later. Christianity, like the, the, the folks who are following Jesus in the first century, were all Jews. And Paul was the one who was starting to reach out to uh, the non-Jewish people. And um, reading and studying N.T. Wright stuff, I can imagine myself there. I can imagine myself having a similar conversation to the one that I ultimately had with my parents, saying that I, this Christian thing makes sense and I'm a Christian. As, as if I were in first century Israel and went back to my parents' house and said, there is this person, Yeshua uh, ben Yosef, Jesus, the, you know, uh, he wasn't, G- he called Jesus Christ. That's like Jesus of Messiah was kind of a title. He was Yeshua, the son of Joseph, you know? So I could say, I, I think this guy might be the Messiah. I think he might be it. I can imagine that conversation. It was a very Jewish conversation. So understanding that concept, that image, if you will, not that the image isn't the right way to, but like imagining that allowed me to place myself within a larger story and and make coherent sense of, of all of this. A lot of the questions that I was grappling with, I was able to not come to conclusions because I I find that a lot of conclusions that one arrives at just opens the door for like a thousand more questions. So it it just allowed me to take that next step. Like I said, it was more of a continuation Uh, than grappling now over these last 20 something years with, with those next set of questions, but understanding quite simply the concept that I believe in an open universe, I believe in God, I believe in a creator God, but I believe that something is wrong in the hardwiring of this creation. But I also believe that this creator God allowed people, allowed his creatures to, to participate in this larger plan of redeeming that creation. You know, and even if you're more secular or even atheist, we could probably agree that there's problems in the world, right? And human beings are uniquely equipped, you know, to join together to solve some of these big problems. I think of it more in theological terms, but even my humanistic, atheist, agnostic friends, we can we can agree on that concept like hey, in good will, in good faith, if you will, let's go arm in arm. And, and figure out some problems that we can tackle together. So placing myself in that story, and again, for me, it's a theological one, allowed me to take those next steps and continue moving forward and continue pursuing coherent, cohesive, ethically based, uh, philosophically sound answers to a lot of these questions. Does that, does that answer your question, Zoe? It, it does. It's like you're on, it's, it's sort of like you're on a path and then like the further you go, right. It's you get more of a realization and a more affirmation of, of what you believe. And it just expands your, your sort of way of thinking. Like the, the more you continue through and you, you take this bits of information, like, okay, now I am understanding maybe, you know, 
you know, Christianity and and maybe that's more of, of what I'm aligned with. You're right. It builds on whatever foundation you already had, because as you said, the early Christians were Jews. Yeah. And so, yeah, it, it, it's, I get it. Yeah. And don't get me wrong, Zoe, like sometimes there is a moment where <laughs> one of my favorite contemporary theologians, a guy named Stanley Hauerwas, was talking to a buddy of mine who's now a professor at, at Fuller. And uh, Stanley was just asking him what some of the stuff he was reading. And he mentioned N.T. Wright, actually. He mentioned mm. uh, there's there's another uh, theologian that came out of Notre Dame at the time. And I just remember Stanley, Stanley knew that the stuff that my buddy Tommy was reading would really mess up his world. So some of, sometimes it's not a confirmation um, so that you are you can right. take a next step. It's what Stanley called, he said, oh, you're reading some of that? Well, that's a real mind fuck. So, <laughs> so you, you don't expect that to come from your, your favorite theologian, Christian theologian, but Stanley has you a don't. way of shocking you. But he's right because sometimes you're on this path and you think, okay, you know, I got my purple belt. I'm going to get the stripe on my purple belt. Now I'm going to get the second stripe. And then along comes this concept that says this whole thing. No, it blows it up. It completely blows it up. Like the whole dropping the whole Jesus thing in my Jewish life and thought process was a real mind fuck. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So yeah, sometimes, sometimes you just take a hard turn or even reverse course when you come to uh, some, some of these inconvenient truths. But I think being able to reckon with that, it would do us all a little bit of good. Cause I think one of the problems we probably get to this in this conversation, but one of the problems I think in our public discourse in dialogues, just like this is a lot of folks start with their preferences and end with their preferences. And to the degree that authoritative philosophical substance comes in conflict with their preferences, they're going to back away from that. Just like you see a lot of Christians today, really just reveling in Donald freaking Trump, you know, like Donald Trump is most (laughs) anti-Christian, anti-moral. He's not just amoral, he's anti-moral, but they like him. People don't, it's weird. They don't see it. And to me, it's a very clear thing to see, but they can't seem to connect that. Yeah. Well, it's a, it's, it's what we call cognitive dissonance. Yeah. You know, I, and listen, I, I'm going to sound like kind of an asshole right now, but like <laughs> there are some people who don't have as high of an IQ. I don't begrudge that. But when you combine lack of a uh, intelligence with a brazen, like embrace of, I am not going to learn anything. And I've decided, you know, so you combine like lack of intelligence combined with being an, a- you know, being an asshole. I just don't think you can afford that combination. You can't just be, you can't be dumb and mean at the same time, (laughs) you know? So, so I think that's a couple of those ingredients are in the mix there, but yeah, you're getting folks who are like, not just, not just ignorant, but like willfully ignorant. Don't tell me anything different. I've already decided and made up my mind. You know, I don't care that he's the exact opposite of the fruit of the spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, self-control. I don't care about any of that stuff because I know I like Donald Trump and Bible be damned, literally, (laughs) you know? So... (laughs) Yeah, that's your Southern coming out, huh? Um, Yeah, yeah. I got a (laughs) wife from Alabama, so. You're right, because we do gravitate or engage in circles that think like us, right? It's it's very hard to find people that are hanging out with people that have opposite views because we just, you know, we kind of want validation of our own thoughts and our own values. And, And that goes for the liberals, the conservatives, right? I mean, you don't really find them gelling. Um, in like social circles. So I guess after I said all of that, one thing to go back is, so how did you deal with your mind fuck? (laughs) I'm still dealing with it. Uh, (laughs) Therapy, uh, drink a lot. Okay. (laughs) Good whiskey. No, (laughs) Um, sometimes I embrace it like a revelation. It's a wonderful epiphany. Like, oh, I didn't see that before. And it's great. Sometimes it takes a lot of uncoiling of a lot of my other suppositions, or there's this bright light that's shining on the imperfections and inaccuracies of a lot of those suppositions. So I have to go back to those and rethink a lot of those. I, I think it's a gift when, when you're presented with good thinking, um, when you're presented with somebody who disagrees with you on something and they make some sense. Like I had these series of conversations with a fellow named Jonathan Rausch wrote a great book. And by the way, I'd recommend it to anybody called The Constitution of Knowledge, The Defense of Truth. It's about truth. Uh, Jonathan happens to be an atheist. And man, he really challenged some of my assumptions. And I'm still thinking, we've talked now, it's been about a month since we talked. I got to circle back around with him. But he challenged me as a theist, as someone who believes in God on some basic levels, 
two levels that he, I had a couple of things that I wanted to have him think through, like uh, from where, do, where does an atheist derive a moral code? Um, is there a transcendent authority uh, for how we decide on what is right and what is wrong, what is good, what is bad, uh, what is good, what is evil, I should say. But he challenged me on, on a couple of issues, specifically on what he referred to as murder and magic. Uh, now, specifically what he meant by murder was uh, a lot of times when someone has a problem with the concept of God, they say, if there was a God, how can children die from cancer? How can there have been a plague? How can there have been a pandemic? How can all these bad things happen in the world? The problem of murder, right? That's a problem. If I'm going to take it, if I'm going to take my own faith seriously, I have to reckon with that problem and deal with it. The other problem is magic. Like I said before, I believe in certain supernatural things. I don't necessarily believe in seven literal 24 hour days just because I don't think that's what Genesis 1 and 2 is talking about. But I do believe in a literal physical resurrection, a bodily resurrection of Jesus. So I believe in that particular miracle. So I got to deal with that. How do I deal with that? Now, as I've thought through that, I do think that a philosophical belief that I have, a philosophical conclusion that I came to, that being uh, what's called an open universe, that I don't believe that the physical universe, that the um, material world, if you, if you will, material, the a purely materialistic way of looking at the universe is the end all be all. I think there's something beyond that. Even physicists have been grappling with multiverse and concepts like that. But I just believe in, in a something beyond the physical realm. And therefore, I believe that there are things that can act um, outside of it and inside of it. Uh, so that, that's how I deal with that. It's, I'm completely oversimplifying. And this is like a, a concept that we could grapple with for years and years and years alone. But I thought that kind of conversation, when when someone as earnest and, and comes in goodwill into a conversation like this, challenges me, I find it to be a gift. Because listen, at the end of the day, I, I'm not on team Jesus necessarily. I'm on team Jesus because I believe it's true. I, at the end of the day, I'm a truth seeker. So if somebody comes to me and because of one of our core beliefs, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And I think that's speaking to who we are uniquely as human beings, heart, soul, mind, and strength, our emotions, our soul, spiritual, transcendent strength, our physical being, uh, our mind, intellect. We're not supposed to leave aside our, and what we were talking about before, cognitive dissonance or, or willful ignorance. We're leaving aside our mind. We're not loving the Lord in our way. So if something resonates with me on those four realms in those four air pillars and, and, and proves that, oh, no, 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 there's no God. I'm on team truth at the end of the day. I just happen to believe that God exists. I am not God, that these two truths are the most irreducible, unverifiable things in the universe to me. So at the end of the day, I'm on team truth and I embrace it when somebody comes to me and shines a light on the um, where, where my foundation has cracks in it. Do you have those conversations with people often? You know, I love those conversations because yeah. I love having philosophical and and even I mean, just theological conversations with people that are like completely different in their their views and opinions. Because I, I think yeah, it does. It it helps you to discern what is true for you, right? And to be closed minded and and to not hear the thoughts of other people that. I feel like that goes against the truth seeking. And, and I think the whole point is to seek the truth, to find what is true for you. I mean, just to find the truth. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. I do seek these conversations out all the time in, in any given circumstance. Now, a lot of times we have to cut through a lot of the weeds in order to get to the real fruit of the conversation. Uh, because a lot of us are shaped by all the wrong kinds of voices. Like, listen, your program, I think, is a wonderful program because you both have capacity for nuance and thoughtfulness. And a lot of the virtues that I find really godly, if you will, that I, I, I am drawn to just as from one human being to another. So you, you exemplify a lot of these virtues. There's a lot of folks who are much more shaped by whether it's Dan Bongino or Sean Hannity or some of these you know, loud mouths <laughs> on, that, that are extremists and screamers yeah. or that, you know, to be fair, there's other folks who are screamers and extremists and radicals um, that are liberal in all different other kinds of ways. I'm not going to say right and left because I just think that's an insufficient way of thinking about our political and social yeah. differences. But I, I think they're, they're screamers from all directions. Right. And, and a lot of us, if we're even engaged on these issues, 
um, we're shaped, our thoughts and our initial talk is shaped by those screamers. So we have to cut through a lot of that in order to get to the other people that we're talking to, in order to get to them, that posture of, hmm, that's an interesting point. Huh, help me understand that. You know, I love to get to that point. That's that's where the real fruit of the conversation is. When we can get past the, the talking points, if you will, or the regurgitation of those talking points and get to, huh, I didn't think of it that way. Huh, let me think about this. You know, I love getting to that part. But so a lot of times you're just not able to get there because you're on the Thanksgiving table with Uncle Uncle Bill who's got his freaking red cap on and and uh, your, your well-meaning uh, so and so who who is just gonna you know yell at Uncle Bill for for being a prejudice whatever and you know it just there's a majority of us I think though that um, what David French and, and Curtis Chang refer to as the exhausted majority we just let a lot of the screamers take all the oxygen out of the room and we're just exhausted from it but I want to take some of that space back. I want to take some of the space back in the in the village square, if you will, for those of us who do love nuance, who do want to find folks, not folks that necessarily agree with us, but specifically folks that we disagree with, that we can learn from and understand each other better across our differences. So yeah, I look for it all the time, especially over a good whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> and you're from New Jersey, so you're always going to be running towards the fire. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, they got a nickname for me. Uh, so, you know, there's rumors that I play poker now and then. They got a, my, a friends of mine that we play together a lot. They got a nickname for me. It's GFY, you know, because I'm in Southern California now uh, and they know I'm, I'm the, the the Jew from Jersey. He become, became a Christian, so they know I'm from Jersey. <laughs> so they they call me GFY and y'all know what that is, right? No, no. It's because I had a habit every once in a while of just telling somebody to go fuck themselves, you know, like oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. somebody sits yeah. down at the table and they're all like, they're all big. They're all puffing out their chest, you know, peacocking and all. I'm like, hey, you know, so you're going to tell us all how to play, huh? And, and then he starts off and does his, you know, peacocking thing. I'm like, yeah, go fuck yourself. It's so funny because <laughs> I do it. And I, I just had this like revelation like last week. I was like, oh, man, I really do say that like a lot. It's crazy. But it's you guys really seem so funny. gentle. Well, it's, it's because it's, in Jersey, it's another form of like, I love you. Like, right, to that's the table. Was, go fuck yourself. I think I even like, so, Shandi, I think I even mentioned it to you. Like the way that we speak, we curse a lot, but it's not like in, in a negative way. We just, it's just a thing. I'm still not I, used I, to it. Like, I'll just started, say like, oh, fuck you. You know what I mean? Like, it's just, yeah. it's just, that's it. I did. Mm -hmm. I wrote a whole scene one time and it was just that it was just fuck you, fuck you, fuck you, fuck you. <laughs> so the actors had to make choices of like, fuck you. Fuck you. Fuck you. Fuck you. you know, like, <laughs> it was great. They all made choices about their point of view. But like, listen, when my kids started getting old enough to start cursing, I said, first of all, don't ever say you're cussing. Like that doesn't work for me. We cur we're from Jersey. We we're curse, cursing. Okay. We're cursing. That's number one. Number two, like be creative about it. Like yes. if it's well-placed and creatively used, I'm all for it. I don't but care. Curses right. are gifts. Don't just waste them. You know, using yeah. the F bomb, you know, every other word. That's just got to use it appropriately. And yes. it, it's got it. It's got to be unique. Yes. Wonder how your wife from the Bible Belt feels <laughs> about that. She was not as comfortable with that notion. <laughs> so, yeah. So we, yeah. we've had discussions, civil <laughs> discussions over the years about this very issue. <laughs> it's it's wow. funny. Yeah. My, my dad is from the South. So it's he doesn't even curse as much. Right. So then when I was a kid, like growing up, like, you know, my mother, like just all the time. Right. My mother's yeah. family all the time. And then, so I, you know, I, me, I'm going to develop that too. My brother as well. But then, you know, my father would be kind of like upset that we're, we're cursing. I'm like, you have to understand you've been here for years, man. Like you should know this by now that this is just, this is just how we talk. I got a very serious point about this. Um, so I, as you know, I go to church and hang out with a bunch of us, us Bible thumpers. Yeah. We, we hang out and do these Bible study things, talk about yeah. evangelism. And uh, this one guy was talking about how he does evangelism. And he said, well, you know, at work, I think everybody knows that I'm different because I don't cuss. And they're going to, they're going to come to me and, and notice that I don't cuss. And they're going to ask me about the Lord. I'm going to tell them about the Lord. And they come to the, I'm like, let me tell you something. <laughs> First of all, you not cussing doesn't mean you're not an asshole. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. so this whole notion that you don't cuss is, is going to lead people to the Lord or, or the, the idea that you feel like you have to act different. You have to put on something, something as, as uh, shallow as, as yeah. using certain words or not using certain words. I don't know. I find that to be so transparently shallow. Uh, I'm just, I don't know. I found that you're to right. be uh, annoying to be, to be but honest. There are definitely people that do that. 
there are there are a large amount of people that do that and sort of just changing up, you yeah. know, when it comes to being religious. Yeah. Um, well, well, that's the thing. I, I I mean, if we're talking about evangelism itself, I think one of the problems of American version of evangelism is this notion, number one, that we have to basically um, be colonialists, not really a, <laughs> share good news about what's happening in the world and how we can participate in making the world right. a better place, but how we have to colonialize people and get them to agree with us. You know, and then the, the way that we get them to agree with us is by proving that we are smarter, we're better looking, our kids are the captains of the soccer team and get straight A's, and therefore you need to agree with us. Meanwhile, I know those people and I know what's happening behind those closed doors, and I know those kids are little shits. I just know what's going on. And yeah. I think it's a bunch of bullshit in order to can, can you know sell you some concept. Maybe it's just me because I grew up Jewish and I grew up outside. So all this stuff looks alien to me, but this this whole idea of evangelism, it's good that a lot of it is being challenged right now because it does need to be rethought. To what degree are we yeah. evangelizing good news about what God's doing in the world and how we can participate in good stuff in the world? And to what degree are we just colonialists? To what degree are we just building an empire of the world with guns and gold and all kinds of other stuff that has nothing to do with God? No, you're right. Because you know what? Maybe you do have a, I mean, you probably do have a really unique perspective, especially in terms of Christianity, because you grew up Jewish. Two questions then. Your family, what, you know, when you decided to switch religions, what, you know, what was their reaction? And how did other Christians react to, you know, you converting from Judaism to Christianity? So my family just thought it was one, oh, that's wonderful. Should we have an affair? Should we get some tunics? No, actually, <laughs> they didn't say that at all. It was, uh, <laughs> it was very contentious. Uh, okay. In fact, the conversations that I ended up having with my dad, in particular, very early on, we're still having some of those conversations to this day. Uh, very contentious at first, especially those first three or four years, because there's a lot at stake. You know, as as a Jew, in particular, a Jew from the Northeast, I am one generation removed from the Cossacks storming through our town, burning down our houses in Ukraine, in Chernyostrov, Ukraine, raping our great grandparents, burning down our houses, beheading the, the terrible atrocities that we suffered at the hands of men wearing crosses on their chests. Yeah. I'm very cognizant of that being in my heritage, being in my DNA, growing up with my grandmother, telling, having lived through these very things. The other part of my family is from Romania and Poland and parts of Europe that the, the folks from our family that didn't come to the States were eviscerated in the Holocaust, again, at the hands of men wearing crosses on their helmets um, or, or uh, were part of a regime that, that was given permission, essentially, by the institutional church. Not every Christian in, in, in Nazi Germany was Bonhoeffer who was fighting against it. In fact, he was put to death specifically because of how much of an outlier he was in, in following his theological Christian beliefs. Uh, but that was at odds with the institutional church. So I'm cognizant of what my embrace of Jesus as Messiah represents to my family, my Jewish family. I'm very cognizant of that. Now, that's a whole other conversation. And like I said, I've been having that conversation for 20-something years with my family. And uh, my dad's the, 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 the one I've had the most uh, dialogue with. And we've it's helped me and equipped me uh, to continue this dialogue because my understanding of my faith, as a, of my family and, and my birth religion, is that much more enriched because of those conflicts. And is, I have a much deeper appreciation for who I am as a Jew, because I still consider myself a Jew. I am a Jew. In fact, if you want to talk about, God forbid, anybody like Hitler ever came back, I'm still Jew enough, Jewish enough to put to death, literally. Uh, I'm not trying to be hyperbolic, but that's literally what, what would happen. As far as my Christian friends, there was great celebration. It was like, we, we won, victory. You know, everybody went to a... <laughs> You know, we got one for Jesus, you know, so it was, uh, <laughs> we got him yeah. to our side. Yeah. To our, on side. our team. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm like, wait till they get a load of me. <laughs> <You know? laughs> um, so I'm like, yeah, I'll tell my story about how I came to the Lord and to Jesus Messiah, the whole thing and um, shared that. But I also immediately started to find myself at odds with some of the primary identifiers of the American evangelical church. A lot of the Bible studies I was going to, what, what defined that community of people um, in the, that church I was going to for the first 10 years or so, first things that you would describe weren't necessarily what I was picking up in my Bible. You, you wouldn't say that what was most important to them 
was say like, uh, I was talking to somebody this morning about Leviticus 19, which if you read it, you, you would, and you believe that the Bible is authoritative, you would have to come to the conclusion that the only policy we could derive in terms of immigration is an open border policy. That's directly from the Bible if you're taking your Bible yeah. seriously. Now, uh, I'm not necessarily advocating for that. I'm just saying that there are things that come directly at odds with what defines, w- with a lot of sociopolitical preferences of the church that I enter into. So I found it interesting. I'm not saying that I'm a prophet of any sort, but I, I did have a unique perspective having you know not come to Christianity until I was 29 years old. I had thought through a lot of these things. And a lot of times, just as one outlier in a small Bible study, um, I'd ask questions that you weren't supposed to ask, or maybe people felt uncomfortable even thinking through. Again, I am not a prophet, but when I read the prophets and see how much of an outlier somebody like Daniel was, or Malachi was, or Jeremiah was, they were ostracized by the people of Israel. They were ostracized by their own community. There were voices that were saying, hey, what you're worshiping or, you know, even Moses, when he came down from, from Mount Sinai and saw everybody worshiping golden calf, it wasn't embraced like, oh, yeah, you're right. So, sorry about that. Let's uh, turn tail here and uh, do what he says. No, they, they, they wanted a lot of these prophets who said, now, wait a second, who, who are you worshiping? You're worshiping golden calf or and could, all different kinds of versions of that. You're doing all kinds of things that are against God's word because your social and political preferences are, are taking over, you know, or, or in more recent years, we already talked about you know, DJT, the, the ex-president, the, the disgraced ex, uh, yeah. people who embrace that, ha- that is directly at odds with the virtues of scripture. You can turn to practically any page of the Bible and it testifies against the words, actions, and character of Donald Trump. Being that you're, you're going to be the outlier because we get used to this rut. We get used to these habits. We get used to these, sh- like you were saying before, Shandi, these shared perspectives, and we're only confirming it for each other. And we kind of lose sight of the real deal. We, we stop looking at our compass, our true north. The, the, the biggest temptations for people of faith, even people, atheists of faith, you know, atheists can be of faith in just goodwill or goodness, right? The, the, the threats to goodwill and good faith, whatever that faith might look like, are not those threats that come from 180 degrees of difference. You could spot those from a mile away. The ones that are most more threatening are the ones that are five degrees off. That, that this looks a lot like true worship. This looks a lot like true community. This looks a lot like true goodness, but it's five degrees off. Those are more pervasive. Those, I think, are more dangerous. In, in the church community, I've been kicked out of a couple of Bible studies, in fact. Causing <laughs> <So. laughs> too much trouble. Yeah, causing good trouble, good trouble, yeah. as they say. I mean, is it is it, you know, asking too many questions too? I mean, that's a thing that when you question things, when you have like a solid core group of people who they just kind of go along with with things, they don't think on their own, they don't dig deeper and and read. Some people don't even actually read the Bible yeah. enough to know it. And they just sort of regurgitate the same things over and over again without actually digging deeper and reading. And then when you question something that, yeah, I mean, that might cause some problems. Yeah. I find that that is a reflexive response a lot of times because whether people say it out loud or not, the subtext is, no, we've already thought about that. We got that all figured out. We don't have to think about that anymore. Why are you asking that question? You know, we already decided that Barack Hussein Obama, for example, is the antichrist. We already decided that our pastor told us, or this guest speaker told us, you know, and they know better. So we're going to outsource our thinking. We've already got that covered. You don't have to ask the question about who we are as Christians. You don't have to ask a question about how we think. Somebody already thought for us and we decided that's okay. So that we're going to think that way. Don't ask questions like that. Yeah. I've been in rooms where auditoriums, in fact, I'm thinking of there, there was a guest speaker uh, that came to our kids went to a Christian school and this guest speaker came and I thought they were going to speak on, um, she, she grew up in Poland, so she was going to speak on what it was like to grow up in a communist country or socialist country. She spoke for an hour on the, the, the Marxism and Muslim. I'm like, wait, he can't be Marxist and Muslim at the same time. Of Barack Hussein Obama, he's probably a terrorist. I'm like, what are we doing here? Who are we? Classical Christian education. What does this have to do with it? You know, I got up and man, I was screamed down from the back of the auditorium. I was threatened oh. out in the parking lot. Just for like, listen, whatever you think about, you vote for him, not vote for him. I, I, I could care less. You, that's your right. That's a beautiful thing about democracy in America. You can vote for him or not. Let's not pretend that he is Marxist, Muslim, terrorist, whatever. He's not. In fact, he, there's a lot of things he did a good job on, dare I say, <laughs> you know? So 
Yeah. So things like that, it's to your point, Zoe, there's a lot of folks that get frankly lazy and atrophied and, and in fact, don't love the Lord with their mind. And, and again, we're supposed to love the Lord or just again, for folks that are more agnostic or non-religious, just love goodness with all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your mind, all of your strength. That's a good thing to do. They probably see you as a legitimate threat, right? Because if you were not in Christian and fighting against in the auditorium, I'm like, oh, he's just a crazy guy. He maybe would be indifferent, but yeah. since you are a Christian, so you're like them, but you're also challenging them. I would assume that's more, that's seen more as legitimate than someone like me, who's not Christian and I'm spouting those um, yeah. beliefs. Yeah. So I, I hesitate to give myself more credit to, to say like a legitimate threat. I, I like, I don't want to pump myself up that way. Cause like, you know, I was maybe an annoyance for 30 seconds and I, I'm never thought of, or those, the, right. that thought was never given any more consideration beyond that. So I want, I want to, I don't want to, like, I'm not trying to be falsely humble here, uh, but that that's the reality is that sometimes I'm just an annoyance and, and I'm not doing it all the time because a lot of times we do settle on the same thing. Like when we really do think about it, when we really do say, Hey, are you a truth seeker? Or are you a fundamentalist in terms of your social political preferences? And I could kind of separate the wheat from the chafe, if you will, which is actually a biblical reference. But when I get to those truth seekers, we can we can start to zero in on what is true uh, and what we agree upon and certain principles that we agree upon. But um, I do have to admit, it's um, it's fun because I do know my Bible. And uh, sometimes I will just respond to somebody who's a professing Christian with verse after verse after verse. You know, they'll make an objection about, you know, how Donald Trump did this and did that. And like these six things, know these seven, the Lord hates. And it's a, it's a direct quote from scripture. And all of a sudden, the things that are quoted are like, describe Donald Trump to a T. You know, I'll describe like, well, you know, you don't know the love that's in his heart. He's, and I'm like, love, love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. That's none of Donald Trump. <laughs> He's on the wrong side of that whole scorecard. So I have, I do kind of delight in, you know, knowing my scripture because I do believe in the Bible. I'm a Christian. You know, I believe these things and, and I want to work towards a better church. I want to work towards a better evangelia. I want to work towards a better apologia. I want to work towards a better version of this stuff and point out like, hey, this thing that you're thinking of as evangelical, it ain't even evangelical. They're worshiping a whole different set of things and it ain't God. It ain't the Bible. Let's point that out so that real goodness can be, can be highlighted and underscored and good people you know, of all different kinds of uh, philosophies and faiths can come together and start doing good work together. You know, so yeah, I do have an agenda and that that's my agenda is like, there's good in the world. There's a lot of good in the world. So, and a lot of folks due to our own making are, are not part of the church, not Christians. And it's, it's a lot of it is our own fault because of the, 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 the idols that we've worshiped. So yeah, I do. Um, I do consider it part of my job. First of all, to pursue righteousness to be earnest in my own faith, uh, to be cognizant of my own shortcomings, you know, that's probably job number one, but also, you know, if I'm really earnestly reckoning with scripture inside the church, which is our authority, and we comment to certain things that are at odds with how we're behaving out in the world. Yeah. I want to point that out. I want to grapple with it so that we can come to a better understanding. And sometimes I'm wrong, you know, and and that's cool too, but uh, yeah, just trying to trying to work towards the better in all in all situations. It's interesting that it's like people tend to mix, you know, their personal feelings and beliefs, their religion and and also even just cultural issues into you know their their religious beliefs. I mean, to some extent it's understandable that's going to happen, but there's like a level of it that at some point it just sort of taints, I don't, I guess in some way it just kind of taints their beliefs to, to an yeah. extent, right? It kind of just, there's too much of it involved and they can't yeah. see clearly. Yeah. It's, it's, um, it's treacherous ground that we walk on because I, I some, some folks push back on me. This happens quite often where it's like, well, you know, religion has really done great harm to politics and people should not allow religion to taint their, their political positions. But I say, okay, set religion or my particular theology and philosophy aside, I would say that I do not want to embrace a policy just because it has a D before, you know, that, that, that people with D before their name support it, nor do I want to support a position just because people with R or I support it. 
I want to think through any given issue, any given policy, I want to start with a philosophical framework. Like, what do I believe ethically? I want to start with, with an ethical framework and, and think through ethical and philosophical problems. Again, whether you're, you're a theist or not, or, or some version, some version in the gray, that's okay. But I think it's a worthy endeavor to start with what is philosophically sound, what is ethically sound, and what is the best uh, set of policies that will manifest um, good ethics, good ways of living better together, right? I had this great conversation with a guy that who's a former congressman. We found a couple issues that we really disagree about. We disagree a lot about uh, gun regulation and immigration reform. And I wanted to explore those issues to see if we could talk about politics and religion without killing each other, to, to see, you know, talk about these grave differences, policy differences that we had, um, to see if, if it could be an edifying conversation. I can learn something from him. He can learn something from me. And the best part of the conversation, the most fruitful part of the conversation was realizing that our actual priorities, what we actually value, what we actually want, what's actually important to us is very similar. It's just that in extrapolating those values, he came to along the way, step by step by step, came to very different conclusions right. about gun policy and immigration than I did. I'm okay with that. In goodwill, disagree on how we're going to end up voting. I think there are limitations to that. <laughs> I could never bring myself to vote for Donald Trump. I just can't do it. Like, I don't know. I'm going to say, I was going to say, like, it's hard for me to fathom somebody if you ran in 2024, God forbid, like somebody <laughs> voting for him at that, like, it's hard to justify that, to put your, you know, to check that box. Like, I'm not going to go that far, but I will say folks who are still like either just being completely dismissive of January 6th or still saying, you know, the election was stolen or I don't know, it's kind of supporting the insurrectionists and what the insurrectionists wanted. That's too far for me. You know, at this stage of the game, that's a level of willful ignorance that's doing great harm to our, not just our democracy, but our civics overall. That's the cancer. And we got to, we got to find the antidote to that cancer. So I guess that is that is a, a vote that I think is a little bit too far for me to find a, a ton of common cause with. I mean, this is no excuse, but people have busy lives and but we do have these authoritative figures that we do want to hear from that can almost like distill complicated information into I don't know, 60 second sound bites or something. And I think that's why a lot of people like listening to news podcasts because they distill the information. But it seems like critical thinking is something that we all have to do, which is missing. I mean, in, yeah. from the schools, right? And then that's a whole separate issue. How to critically think so you're not just taking information at face value. Yeah. When you say it's missing from schools, what do you mean? Well, you know, how to like critically think like in a philosophical perspective. I was never really taught that until, I mean, until I took a philosophy class in college. It's interesting because a lot of times people, sometimes I think we think that schools are supposed to do a certain amount of things when in reality, it should also be something that you learn on your own and at home. And I mean, like education is a mixture of things and it's also coming to realizations on your own. I don't want to say that I've never been taught critical thinking, but I also don't want to say that I have. It's one of those things where it's a mixture. And I think it really just also depends on you and how you absorb and think about the information that, that you've been presented with. Thinking on your own is something that some people just don't want to do it. They don't know, they don't know how to do it. That's not something that they've ever had to do before. And then some people, they, they have to do that. I don't know. I think it's just different for everybody in terms of listening to the news and and like if you're going to listen to Fox News or you're going to listen to MSNBC do you just take that information as truth or do you actually think about it and and analyze it in your own mind yeah yeah you're bringing up a lot of really interesting points i do think it's imper imperative for any individual to embrace their own agency and it's unfair for me to take someone who is completely uninformed, who's just completely tapped out over the last seven years, which would be completely understandable, to expect them to get completely up to speed and have a great level of nuanced critical thinking immediately. But we can take everyone where they're at. 
Um, and, and we could do this in, in, in these conversations that we have too. Like a lot of folks are frustrated because they just want to snap their fingers and change everything and get the whole yeah. world to agree with them and completely on the same page with them. That's just not how it works. You know, so I, I've just embraced the reality that I can't in any given situation have a conversation with somebody and get them to completely change their minds on any issue. Yeah. But I think I can in any given situation, not all the time, but a lot of times I can get together with somebody and maybe have one degree of persuasion, one degree of influence. But here's the contingency is that in order for me to be most effective at persuasion, if we're looking at it that way, or edification, I have to be open to the possibility that they'll persuade me or edify me in a certain way. And if I'm, if I'm, if I'm comfortable with certain pillars of truth that I stand on, I'm good with that. I'm also good with the fact that if I'm standing on lies, I want to know about it. I want to know about, it. I want to change in that regard. Somebody I, I was talking to, I said, where do you get your information? I knew he got his information from Bongino and Ben Shapiro and people like that. And I said, how do you develop your opinions? Because it, it's somebody who <laughs> likes to tell me how the left thinks, what the left wants to do, what they're trying to do, what they're going to do. <laughs> I'm like, how do you develop an informed opinion about the left? And he said, well, you know, I forced myself to uh, listen to... Um, What's her name? Six o'clock hour out here on MSNBC. Uh, she she's actually very erudite and and well researched. But a lot of uh, folks who aren't MSNBC, uh, Rachel Maddow. Okay, um, that's what I thought you were talking about, but I wasn't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I, whenever I have listened to her, I found her to be thoughtful and, yeah. like I said, just really well researched and um, brings some interesting points. She certainly has a, a point of view, but like yeah. I force myself to watch her and uh, just see what she's talking about. I'm like that's not a great way. Like to, to look for the opposite, what you think the opposite is, but another way to go about it is to find really thoughtful people that maybe don't share your particular orthodoxy. So for him, I might say, you know what, read, read some David French or Michael Gerson, or, you know, maybe even Will Salatan, who is more like those guys came up in Republican politics, but Will Salatan is definitely more of a left of center um, thinker. Read folks who have nuanced thinking, yeah. you know, or for folks, my uh, so friends of mine who are more liberal or progressive in their thinking, especially with what's happened with the Supreme Court here recently, I would say read a lot of, uh, or listen to somebody like Sarah Isger, who comes from the conservative legal mov movement. Now she's not, uh, she, she is not Fox News uh, material, they would hate to have her on there because she's actually intelligent and yeah. you know very thoughtful. Um, but she's a definite conservative in her legal thinking. I've learned so much from listening to Sarah. She's on ABC, uh, the Sunday morning show, um, occasionally. She was Carly Fiorina's uh, campaign manager. Uh, she was what's his name, uh, the first Trump AG. She was his spokesman, uh, the guy from Alabama. So she's like bona fide conservative. And, and a very accomplished attorney as well. But she's also someone, when you listen to her, you get a much more detailed understanding of thinking through actual justices' opinions, dissenting opinions, um, you know, and that's a better way to go about it as opposed to like, well, it, you know, if my progressive friend wants to learn what's going on on the conservative side and he turns on, you know, the Will Cow majority or Tucker for, for 10 minutes, that, that's not a great way to inform yourself about another um, another point of view. That's just a way to piss yourself off, <laughs> you know? Um, so I don't, I think that's a better way, you know, find better thinkers, not, not um, talking heads from the quote unquote other side. That's just exacerbating the problem. Find good thinkers that, that have a different point of view. And that's really, that's really helped me and other folks that I know that are really trying to think better, think more critically, as you would say, Shandi. Yeah. And not shooting down people for different ideas or because you know, these issues, people get emotional and, yeah, and that's fine to a point, but you know, you yeah. really, like you said, you do have to have a dialogue, a discourse, not, it's not a one-way street. It's just it's right. not a lecture. Right. Yeah. As long as I can lecture and everybody agrees <laughs> with me. <laughs> as long as you can lecture and everybody agrees with you, the world is, is all okay. <laughs> Man, could you imagine how awful of a shape would we we would be in if that were the case? <laughs> We'd be like all oh, like tripping up, tripping all over ourselves on too much whiskey, losing our shirts, playing poker. It'd be it'd be terrible. It'd be awful. Yeah. But, so my pastor, he came to me. I went. We, we went to a new church. He wanted me to get involved in ministry, and and I'm like, 
I'm like, uh, hey, Dave, you just got to know something up front. I curse, I drink, and I play poker. <laughs> it, and that's just like, I don't find that to be at odds with scripture at all. And he goes, this is why I love Dave. He goes, man, you're going to be a pain in the ass, but I love you. <laughs> <laughs> that's so like, funny. Okay. Just wanted to be upfront about all that. <laughs> yeah. So you're molding those young minds with all of that said. <laughs> Corrupting those young minds. <laughs> yeah. And so, yeah, like you said, you went from a more um, evangelical style of, of, of church. Uh, I believe it was Southern Baptist. Or, or yeah. Was? Yeah. The, okay. uh, Grace is probably, they might be independent, but they're Grace Baptist Church. So they're okay. Yeah, I, it's interesting because I've been looking for what they've been saying about what's been coming out of the SBC here over the last year or so. I can't find much. I think they just want to put their head in the sand and just avoid the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, you've gone from from you know Southern Baptist to Presbyterian, and you know, as someone who was who was new to or newer to Christianity, um, you know, you kind of fell into the Southern Baptist denomination, but. What led you to the Presbyterian denomination? Yeah, so I don't know all the differences. I still don't know all the differences okay. <laughs> between the de denominations. What I was really looking for was a church community that read their Bible well, and the what they were extrapolating and manifesting in terms of how the Bible and the Spirit was informing them matched up with what is in the Bible. You know, I, I found too many church communities who put their political preferences first and backed a lot of shards of scripture into that. So I, I couldn't deal with that. And there were some other just annoying attributes that, you know, was sort of making fun of that guy. Like, I don't cuss and everybody's going to be attracted to me because I don't cuss. I'm like, go oh, fuck yourself. <laughs> you know, um, so I, I was looking for people. I was just looking for people who were more real, more authentic. I was put, looking for people who are more consistent, you know, and, and when you find those people who are more real, it's like, you know, the people like when we sit in a Bible study and everybody's like, no, my kids are great. We're awesome. They're all going to Ivy League schools. And like, but when you sit down in a Bible study and it, people are real right out front, like, hey, you know what? Uh, my, my 15 year old is on drugs and we're trying to figure that out. You know, uh, my wife and I are separated now and, uh, you know, marriage is tough. Like, I, not that I'm looking for people to have problems. Right. Um, but for, for people just to be real about it and let's do life together. Like I, a, 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 a partner in a, my business, we have this expression, we can deal really well in the truth. But if you're putting up a whole veneer for me, I, I can't, we can't do any work together, you know? So not so coincidentally, when I found a church community that was more real, more authentic, I found that when, when we were reading big chunks of scripture, because that was another thing. They didn't tend to take a little half of a verse here and a little half of a verse there and put it all together and say, and say let's go vote for Donald Trump. You know, they, like they would, they would read scripture well because they were reading bigger chunks of scripture, reading whole chapters, sometimes whole letters, whole books, you know? So when it wasn't such a coincidence that people who really get uh, contextual uh, with good philosophy, good theology in this case, that you, what manifests is more real, being more real and being more authentic with each other. So that's really what we were looking for. And, uh, you know, thank goodness we found, we found a great community who's, who's all about that. That's great. And it takes time too, right? And yeah. So, yeah. and, and nobody's perfect. Like no church community is yeah. perfect because we're made up of people, you know? And uh, people are all kinds of imperfect in all kinds of beautiful ways. So just as long as we're cool with that, as long as we're accepting of that and affirming of that, you know, affirming of each other's imperfections and all of that beauty, <laughs> you know, that's, um, that's, it's, it's part, part of a mindset, but, you know, <laughs> I don't know the, the other, there were other church communities that we were part of Bible studies that were part of that were pretending to be perfect, which I can kind of accept and affirm in there that's an imperfection in and of itself but that was a little less i don't know easy to deal with i guess or less forgivable in a way because it's bullshit like i i just didn't life's too short you know so and life is messy too right so yeah can't yeah. get everything in one in one cup of tea yeah or a bible study group or church <laughs> community so yeah exactly Cause I feel like, you know, when you're, you're looking for, you know, your, I guess your, your religious community, you, you want an actual community, a group of people who are different, 
but can come together and and discuss things and and not necessarily always agree, but you know, at least want to be a part of each other's lives and, and help each other thrive and, and do better and and as a community solve problems and, and figure things out. Yeah, yeah, real practical problems. Uh, participate in a community. Um, participate in a community of people to go through life together, to go through these tough things, tough chapters in life together, um, to uh, address issues in our neighborhood. You know, these uh, certain folks, uh, Pasadena is the uh, area where our church is. There's a a large number of people who don't have um, permanent homes, you know, so, you know, some are living on the street uh, right now, you know, so that that's a real issue. Those are real people. So uh, to the degree that we can, give some aid to some of those folks that's doing real work. That's doing real tikkun olam, healing the world in a very practical way. Now we can't solve all that person's problems, uh, but maybe we can just, you know, have, have a sandwich, you know, Um, you know, maybe we can just wash their feet, literally like wash their feet, you know, somebody who's, who's been walking in the same shoes for, you know, two years for, for, or for, you know, just one pair of shoes, there's holes in them shoes and walking on, sidewalks, broken sidewalks, that that's, that's, you know, that that's literally painful, you know, so maybe just washing their feet and bringing some, you know, temporary, albeit temporary relief, bringing them a pair of socks, bringing them a pair of shoes, you know, just some real stuff, man. So yeah, I, I, I like that. Um, and also having, cause listen, our family, I have three kids and they've all gone through various chapters, you know, and, and having a, another group of people that, um, some folks are, you know, living uh, by themselves and, you know, uh, some folks are in similar situations as me. Uh, some folks are uh, dealing with uh, like sexual identity where there's one person who's going in tra- through transition. So having all these different people um, of different backgrounds, of different identities, of different, you know, just different, all kinds of different, right. But helping me um, deal with our situation uh it's easier to deal with in a community of people uh, in, among all of our differences. Um, so there's something to that. I think there's also something to, frankly, the, the ritual side of it. Um, strangely, like the, the Jewish rituals that we still do, I, I have come to appreciate that much more. Like we do the Seder every year, which is the, uh, the nice. ordered dinner for Passover. I love the Seder. We light the Hanukkah candles. We, I don't go to shul for, or synagogue for um, uh, Yom Kippur, but um, just the, those times of year, marking those times of year, you know, in the church, there are similar activities that we do, like breaking the bread and, and drinking the wine, rituals like that. Because for me, it is a symbolic participation in a story uh, in a very tangible way, in a very concrete way, we're participating in this story. Uh, the story of the world that's still being played out, right? That I know when I sit down at a Seder meal uh, on a yearly basis, that's something my father did, my grandfather did. And for generations upon generations, we've been doing this thing. So I'm participating in my family story in that way. You know, so I do, I do embrace those rituals. And I, and I love the fact that my kids are embracing some of those rituals too. They're participating in our story together. I think there's richness and, and meaning in all of that. So well, how would you feel if you're, um, I'm just curious, personally curious, you know, how, what would your reaction be if your um, kids, um, you know, converted to, I mean, do you raise them Christian? Yeah. So we, we okay. put them, this is, oh man, you are opening a can of worms, right? <laughs> That's a so good question. <laughs> one of my greatest regrets is sending them to this damn Christian school. I, I really regret it. Oh, wow. I regret it because number one, the education wasn't great. Uh, once my my oldest kid got to the junior high school, I found out she she was learning from a science teacher who frankly hated science. <laughs> That's not you know, right. And there was all kinds of other stuff that was like primary defining qualities. There were certain aspects of it, like they did learn a little bit of Latin. Um, they started learning about the philosophers. I do believe in the trivium, uh, you know, the the classical approach to education. Uh, but there was a lot more bad than good. I think with my oldest, who I, I mentioned is non-binary. Uh, she had uh, serious trauma, religious trauma from being in that school. Her friends, some of her friends that she's still friends with uh, now who stayed in that school through high school, um, talk about trauma. Like, you know, that, that school was somewhere between pray the gay away and just don't say anything. 
you know, just leave it. Just don't say anything. And, and we'll let you, you know, we'll let you continue to be a part of this school. Like, thank you. Thank you that I can be a human being and I can, you know, be a part of your school. Like, so I regret having sent my kids to that school. Um, the public school education would have been a much better education for them here. But also, I think that they would have got a lot of their more um, Christian, theological, religious formation directly from me, as opposed to people who are worshiping something completely different than what I'm reading in the Bible. So not so coincidentally, each one of the kids has different levels of belief in actual Christianity. A lot of them have come to reject it because um, they're, you know, that first church that we were part of where they grew up in Awana and all the little, you know, the, the, the kids programs there. Um, they just saw once they started thinking, <laughs> they saw a lot of the hypocrisy in all of that. And it was the opposite in a lot of ways of what they were starting to determine to be good. Right. So, um, I, uh, yeah, I, and, and I embrace that because listen, um, if I were to, it's kind of like, it's kind of like God's plan. Um, God, God's plan allows for us freely choosing to love God, you know, like, uh, human beings, the story goes human beings having free will being not God ultimately decided to do something that was very ungodly. <laughs> and we often do those things, you know, but I think a love freely chosen is much more valuable, right? Or a, a faith freely chosen is much more valuable. If they were, if my kids, I was able to program them, that faith is not valuable. That, that, those religious convictions are, are like, there's cracks just waiting to happen. But, but if I allow them to come to their own conclusions, it's much more fertile soil for those roots to go much deeper, you know, and I'm risking the possibility that they're going to, and, and they all, you know, Savannah in particular uh, seems to be ending up on very different uh, conclusions. I, I'm okay with that. Um, what I hope is that if they've got nothing else from me in raising them up in the way they should go is that, they can pursue truth. Uh, they can pursue goodness um, and, and have a sense of discernment of what truth and goodness is when they come up against it. And sometimes they're going to have to learn that's not right. Um, sometimes they're going to have to learn certain things aren't good for them in a more difficult way, you know, but hopefully, hopefully, you know, like when they were little, we kind of baby proof the house. I can't necessarily baby proof the world for them. So when they fall down and go boom, they might hit their head on a, on a sharp corner. Um, I, I hope that it's not, uh, it's not too traumatic. Um, but at the end of the day, they got to live their own lives and come to their own conclusions. So I think that's a fair question, Shandi. And yeah, you know, um, I'd love for them. I'd love for us to agree on big, fundamental, important things, but I don't agree with my parents, you know, like, like my life story, but here's the thing. This is the one, non, one non-negotiable. My kids cannot, must not, will not become Yankee fans. If there's any Yankee <laughs> fan in my family, it's over. Do not come to Thanksgiving. No, Yankee fans, no Yankee hats. 100% agreed. Same. <laughs> Same. Don't bring that over here. Don't bring that yeah. mess over here. <laughs> Automatic disowning, huh? Yes, that's right. You're out of the will. <laughs> and I can make a Learning. theological case that the New York Mets is God's team. I can absolutely do that. You can. I can definitely yeah. make a case that it takes more character to be a Mets fan than a Yankee. Yes. It takes no. It, it doesn't does. take any effort to be a Yankee fan. You've done a few different things, right, Corey? You know, you were a stockbroker, and then you said that you've made it a plan to have this dialogue, this discourse about your. Um, religion, your spirituality um, as a vocation. So how did you come to that and why? Yeah, that's, that's a big question. So I read a book a couple of years ago by David Brooks called The Second Mountain. And it's, a gr it's really worth the read. Uh, one of my favorite books of the last five years that I've read. And it was, I read it right before I turned maybe a year or two before I turned 50. And it just, it, it's an age that tends to lead to this kind of thinking like, you know, okay, what have we done so far? And how much of this life do I got left? And what do I want to do with it? 
Are there major changes that I want to make? The book is about a lot of people go through this. And sometimes that big change is forced upon you, whether it's a serious illness, uh, divorce, uh, financial ruin. There's a number of things that people who have achieved a number of things achieve it on certain talents. And it's the first mountain and then get knocked off that mountain. And, I, and I, I've suffered a few uh, major, major setbacks. Um, but also, you know, now looking at that second mountain that I want to climb, what convictions do I have that are going to define this second climb? And again, I'm way oversimplifying, but for me, those convictions are, I want to be engaged in endeavors that I really believe in their merits. I really believe in their meaning. And I want to be engaged in those endeavors with people that I'd want to have a meaningful relationship with. There's plenty of places, there are plenty of platforms, the bloviating talking heads that are screaming about the left wants you to do this. And those people are like screaming about the other side that they've clearly never talked to, never bothered to try to understand, you know, but to create some space for for people like us you know for people that are exhausted by all the screamers people that aren't extremists necessarily on any particular issue but still are interested in these issues creating some space for us to have these conversations i thought it was important so to um create that platform not just the podcast but what we're doing on social media and in other platforms some of the um other uh, conversations live conversations that we're having um, it's a it's a mission. Tendency to take one data point: Yankees fan, Mets fan, Democrat, Republican. Um, what shade of skin uh, e- each other has? Take one data point and then derive a whole narrative beyond that, right? Um, somebody. A lot of times, it's my religion. So uh, again, I was at a poker game. I had I, midnight rolls around. I'm like, hey guys, we got to get up for church tomorrow. Person sitting next to me. It was uh, a lot of people from uh, friends of mine from the entertainment industry. Person sitting next to me was like. She, she heard church and, and she just goes off on Donald Trump. And I'm like, wait, hold on. I just said, I'm going to church. Like I, I, for the record, I'm not a Donald Trump, but neither here nor there. Like, how did you, how did you jump to all these other conclusions? I, I know how, but it's, that's our tendency is to take one data point and assume all of these other things based on that one data point. I, I just think that's a bad way of doing civics. I think that's a bad way of engaging with each other. I think that's part of what is keeping us separate, you know, but I I just, I embrace the differences. I embrace like when I have a friend that looks different or has a different religion or has a different background, different age, different, whatever, different experiences. I embrace it. Uh, A lot of, a lot of the fighting and the contentiousness is happening because of what we were talking about before, where all I know is one thing that you said, and then I derive all these other things and I'm depriving that person of their humanity, of their dimensionality, you know, whereas if we have these longer conversations, we then understand them as human beings a little bit better. And thus we're not able to as easily generalize and mischaracterize and then vilify or demonize. So I, that's one of the things I just, I've loved about this whole thing. So it seems like you're living your best life, huh? I, I don't know about that. I still got to lose about 30, 35 pounds. So, okay. <laughs> you know, so maybe he's here for money. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, but I, I, I will say that what I'm spending a majority of my waking hours doing, I really, I, I've, I just so appreciate it. to say I'm having fun. It, that's almost too, it's not, it's not enough to, you know, say, cause I spend my days, like e- even the mundane stuff, even the editing, I enjoy the editing, like having learned a new skill like that and getting to revisit parts of conversations and rethink certain things that come up in the editing, e- every bit of it, doing the research to prep for an interview. You know, I'm reading this book about Christian nationalism right now, uh, a guy who grew up in the church um, and is part of the Republican establishment, um, who as an academic studied problem with Christian nationalism, learning so much. So the preparation, the conversations themselves, having other conversations about TPNR, you know, uh, meeting folks like you, it's just been, um, it's been really, really meaningful. And uh, yeah, it's been, it's been really, really special to me that I, I just really, I'm grateful for every bit of it. Thank you so much, Corey. This was fun. It was really good hanging out with you guys. I wish it was, I wish it was a little bit later in the day for me because I would have cracked open a bottle of whiskey and then things would have gotten really interesting. <laughs> oh, yeah.
Yeah. Yeah. I mean, things did get interesting anyway. They got interesting, yeah. But I mean, yeah, I get it. I mean, no, this was great. I enjoyed this a lot. We'd like to thank Corey for sharing his story, his journey, and we just had a lot of fun. Yeah, it was a it was a great conversation. I enjoyed it a lot. So once again, be sure to check out Corey's podcast, Talking Politics and Religion Without Killing Each Other. You can find his podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, probably wherever you get your podcasts. If you aren't following us yet, make sure to do so. We're on Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, and even TikTok. Thanks for listening. See you next time.